Welcome, everybody. And today, uh, I have the honor of having a conversation with Sarah Curto. Sarah is the CEO and head coach of Career You Love Academy. She's the career coach that helps unhappy workers find the work they love, where they have more balance, meaning, and money. She leverages a background in counseling and a long career in human resources and helps over 500 people land jobs that give them the time to live the life they want, where they're fulfilled at work and without sacrificing their paycheck. You can find her on the web at www.sarahcurto.ca. That's S-A-R-A-C-U-R-T-O dot C-A. Hey, Sarah, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hey, Doug, thanks for having me on the show. And yeah, Sarah without an H. So Sarah without an H. <laughs> Let's start off and tell us a little bit about background. You you did things before you got into coaching. Tell us, tell us kind of the journey of how all that took place. Yeah, I uh, went to school for psychology and started my career in the mental health field um, in counseling where I burnt out. It was, well, it was on my list of careers. Uh, it was uh, very challenging. Uh, to dive deep into that world and make the impact that I really wanted to make in people's lives. So I did with what a lot of psych grads do and a lot of people in the mental health field do is I went to human resources thinking, oh, well, this is great. It'll be counseling for employees. And if I had talked to just one HR person, I would have learned that no, it is not counseling for uh, employees. And I kind of knew that day one. So I was in talent acquisition and human resources for 15 years, but knew day one that it was not the career for me, um, but got stuck in it. Like a lot of people get stuck in. I didn't want to waste my education. And I thought if I just tried a different environment or uh, hired for different individuals, that that would change how I felt about it. And it never did. Yeah. So eventually... A long time coming, I finally was able to figure out what it is I actually wanted to do, which was help people navigate their own career journey so you know, they can work less, make more, and have a purpose at work. Wow. I mean, what a great, what a great tagline. Oh, helping thanks. People, <laughs> helping people work less, make as much or more money, and be happy. Yeah, be happy. Like, it's possible. <laughs> how do you how do you go about helping people do that? Uh, first of all, we I uh, we work in a society that glorifies busyness, uh, and unfortunately, when we look at the science of things, uh, it is a bell curve. Our productivity is a bell curve, and what we tend to see in the corporate America, corporate Canada, is that people are on that ten plus hour days thinking they will get more accomplished uh, and being those sort of imprisoned by their emails and their to-do lists and all that stuff. Uh, when I'm working with individuals, we're cutting that down. Like the, I've cut down 15, 16 hour days to eight to 10 hour days. Like wow. It is possible to cut it down to a normal eight to 10 hour day and actually get more done. It's a, it's It seems to me that it's a matter of what do you, what are you controlling and what do you let control you? Yeah, and it's also supercharging and accelerating the the hours with w in which we are working. When we are resting appropriately, giving us time to exercise and move and time to get the proper night's sleep that we need for our individualized needs, uh, we are able to sit down and in an hour do more than we could if we were working 12 hour days, not having time to go out for walks or, right. or or do any other kind of exercise, not being able to sleep, going, go, go, going from everything, never letting our, bri our brains rest. Uh, and then it takes us longer to do those tasks where if we're properly rested, we actually can accomplish more. And the funny thing is, is people then feel more confident because they're rested. Right. And not only is their productivity increasing, their impact is increasing, and they're more vocal about it. They will put up their hand and say something. They will volunteer their opinions. And I see time after time, people then getting uh, tapped on the shoulder for executive leadership programs, uh, I tapped on the shoulder for promotions. I had one client, literally, she came to me because she said, they don't have director jobs in my company. It doesn't exist. 
She went in one morning, they called her in for a meeting and they're like, we're creating this director role for you. Here's $20,000 increase. Wow. All because we had cut her hours from 13 at 12 to 13 hour days to nine hour days. It's just, yeah. Anyway, so that's how we work less, make more money and are happier and more fulfilled doing it and get what we want. I, I totally subscribe to that. <laughs> like, why wouldn't we? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm self-employed. Uh, I was a civil trial lawyer for 22 years, working 60 hour weeks. 80 hour weeks when I was in trial. <clears throat> and then I walked away from it all, kind of like you did. Yes. And I, I went back to school and I got my master's. So I have a law degree and a master's degree. And I got my master's degree in peacemaking and complex studies and became a peacemaker and a mediator. And so everything cool. changed. Mm -hmm. and, and like you, I get to help people every day. It's yeah, really, and, really But hard. you get to do it on your terms. That's right. And unfortunately, what you, you, go ahead. Sorry. I was, that's okay. Uh, what do you think makes you really effective at what you do? What is the, the unique the skill that you have that makes your clients succeed? Uh, if this is an out of the box answer is I kind of think it's my idealism. Hmm. So my idealism is one of my greatest strengths. It's also obviously a weakness, um, but I'm always thinking there's a solution to the problem. I'm always, there's an opportunity here. We just have to find it. And I refuse to be knocked down. So if I am knocked down, I'll get back up or I'll resist it. And I encourage my clients to do the same. When they come to me feeling dejected and feeling like that they're, they're at the end of a road and they are desperately not wanting to be there. I'm like, we, we're just missing it. We're just missing the turn. Or maybe we have to go back a little bit because we missed it. We walk, You went right past it, but it's there. We just have to find it. And I, I think that idealism of knowing it's there and then that empowerment of, I know I can find it. I think that is one of the secrets of my success and me teaching and helping my clients have that attitude is the secret to, to their success as well. How come people are drawn to you? What are they looking um, for? I think that's a great question. I think I'm approachable. I tell it like it is. You seem to be. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think I'm pretty intelligent. I think that's one aspect of it. So people trust what I'm going to say because of my intelligence. But I'm also very approachable and likable, so that they can see that I'm not never going to think I'm above them or uh, put them down or can't be condescending in any way. Uh, I also think people are attracted to that idealism. They, people want hope. As human beings, religion exists for a reason because it provides hope. So I think people look to me in that idealism and want to taste that hope, that belief in themselves. Um, and yeah, I think my ability to understand them, they don't, I think I, I attract a lot of my personality type. My personality type is pretty private, as you can tell from this, my awkwardness in answering this question. So <laughs> uh, we are pretty private and we don't just let anybody in. So I feel a lot of that personality type is attracted to me because I already know them. So they don't even have to let me in. So I think that's a few other reasons it's it, in a way it, uh, the way it sounds to me is you create emotional safety for your clients for sure and you do that in a lot of different ways but when people feel safe with you they they're then able to explore what it is that's holding them back why are they trapped in their jobs and they can they can do some explorations that they they couldn't couldn't or won't do on their own and can do it in the safe space, safe emotional space that you're holding for them to do that work. Yeah. And I think because um, I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's they're entering in a maze, but someone who built the maze, who knows how to get through the maze, right. is walking through the maze with them. So there's no fear that any big bad guys are going to jump out of nowhere. They're going to get lost and never be able to get out again because I'm there with them. So the, the title of, of this podcast is Listening with Leaders. Tell me about your listening skills and how you use them in your work. 
so I am a question asker. It's oh. why I was good in counseling. It's why I was good in recruitment. It's why I'm good at coaching. Uh, one of the strengths of my weakness of being a super private person is I learned from a young age that the best way to get people to stop asking me questions about myself is me asking them questions about themselves and then just sitting back and listening. <laughs> and I needed to keep listening because the more I listened, the more I was able to figure out the next question to ask to keep the spotlight on them. So, so you develop you develop questioning as a protective mechanism. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> to keep to keep the spotlight off of you. Yeah. And it's, so, so you're pretty introverted, huh? I'm a very big introvert. Yeah. So I come across as very extroverted. Um, that because I'm seemingly outgoing, but I need a lot of time by myself to recharge. Yeah. That, uh, that's a really good point. I'm introverted too, believe it or not. And and it's not about introver introverted people can be shy, oh, but many, yeah. many, and many introverted people are not shy. It's just, yeah. where do you get your energy from? And like you, I get my energy from inside. So being by myself or with my wife and not going out to parties and having a big social scene to me is relaxing. Mm -hmm. To an extrovert, it would be hell itself because extrovert- yeah, they get their energy from other people. Yeah. And so they want to be around lots of people and lots of energy and activity. And I, that is not my, that's not me. And it doesn't sound like it's you either. No. And in fact, I need absolute alone time. Yeah. So that's one thing we've learned is it's not like my husband's an introvert as well. And he, like you, is it's fine with the, just us as a family unit, mm -hmm. whereas I need absolute alone time. Wow. Even, so, by, even by yourself. Yeah. Even by myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So when you're listening to your clients, what are you listening for? I'm listening for so many different things. I'm listening for the problems. I'm listening for the uh, ways of self-sabotaging. Self I'm listening for the things that they're not saying. Uh, I'm listening for the patterns and relationships between the things they're saying. So I actually love to have my clients go off in a ramble and then I will kind of stop listening to them a little bit. Like I'll only half listen to them mm. so that I can pick up what they're really saying through the ramble. What's the meaning that they're trying to What's come? the meaning? Yeah. Um, and then that way I can sum up the rambles back to them in like a sentence which then adds the clarity that they need to, to then move forward and to right. solve the problem or to recognize the opportunity or whatever it is. That's the skill of core messaging. That mm -hmm. um, there, I teach four levels of reflective listening. So uh, mirroring, which everybody knows about, you repeat back word for word. That's really good for procedures and rules and shopping lists and recipes and things like that, where you've got to have clarity on task. Um, yeah, I hate mirroring. It, it's very difficult. So annoying. I it's hate right. it when people do it back to me. That's like, right. I feel like they're parroting me. That's exactly yeah. right. However, yeah. I'm an instrument rated pilot. And <clears throat> when I get a, a clearance, I have to mirror back. I have to repeat that, that clearance word for word back to the air traffic controller so that we both know that we're on the same page about what I'm going to do when I take off into the clouds. So mirroring there is really powerful and effective yeah. and necessary. But you're right. Other than Other than repeating back, procedures, recipes, lists, things like that. Uh, it's, it's not a good, very good way to reflect. It's not, it's not properly used. The second level is paraphrasing, which we all know about, where we're just summarizing the words. The third level is what you just described, um, core messaging. So you've got somebody who's rambling on and on and on and on, and they're really trying to figure out what they, what they mean to say, and they don't know what it is, so they're wandering all over the place. And we just listen with, in exactly the way you described. And then, and then come up with a, a one sentence summary of well, what you're really saying is X. Or sometimes I use, teach people to use a metaphor. So it's like you're, you were in a forest and, a, and the snow was just coming down lightly and the moon was shining through and it was beautiful. But all of a sudden, a 40 mile an hour wind came up and now you're finding yourself in a blizzard and completely lost. Yeah. And then the last level of reflective listening, which is the deepest, is called affect labeling. And in affect labeling, you ignore the words. 
and you read the emotions and reflect back the emotions. Yes, and I definitely do that. Because brain science shows that when you do that, magical things happen in the brain. There's some brain scanning studies that are really powerful. So you'd say something like, oh, Sarah, you're really angry. You're really pissed off or you're frustrated or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, those are the, the, that's a kind of listening that I teach, which, which once you've got those four skills mastered, um, you can handle any situation that could come up and be able to listen clearly and stay focused. Well, I think for leadership, I'm knowing all four. Powerful. I find so many leaders, they desire one. Like they want their team members to to demonstrate one. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely got that feedback. Like, Sarah, can you tell me exactly back what I said to you? Right. Yeah, which I don't think is very helpful, but, you know, uh, and the paraphrasing one. But I feel definitely the areas of improvement for a true leader, not a manager, but a leader, and especially the higher you go, are those last two. Core messaging and, and affect labeling. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is that these aren't these very few people teach these skills. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's why there are not many leaders that have really mastered these skills because they're not taught by they're not they're not it's not part of any kind of normal curriculum. Most people still teach that old active listening stuff. What I hear you saying is X, which of course doesn't work either. Oh, <laughs> and that makes it just more makes it work. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, tell me about empathy. I know that empathy is very important to you, as is it is to me. Yeah. Um, so part of the reason why I burnt out in the mental health field was I do have a overdeveloped sense of empathy. Uh, so for me, the work has been opposite of what I think most leaders need to, to work on. And that is more protecting myself and the ability to put up and bring down walls. But as someone who's overly empathetic, I definitely see that not enough people have have even a healthy level of empathy developed. Uh, and so I work from all levels. I work C-suite down to entry level, even some high school students who are exploring their, um, their careers. Uh, and the one thing I'm really hearing from uh, professionals and management level is a massive disconnect from executives. Uh, burnout is on the rise. I know in Canada, stress leave is now one of the most, if not most common reason why people are taking leaves of absences from work, which wow. is crazy to me, like, because we can control this. <laughs> Right, uh, exactly. And I think for leaders, they need to have a little bit more empathy about what's going on in the workplace so that they can have an understanding of what they need to accomplish from a strategic mindset and business strategy point of view, which is where all of the leadership training seems to be on. Uh, so, and how they can have a long-term plan to bring their resources, which is mostly employees, along for that journey in a way that supports everybody. And why this is important is we are seeing a workforce coming up in the ranks with Gen Z and in the ranks with millennials that just will, they'll opt out. And we're seeing that. We're seeing, it, especially in the States, a massive decline in post-secondary enrollments. Oh yeah. Because they're opting out. So we will have a massive labor issue if we don't get leaders on board with empathy and some other skills where they show that they understand and they want to create cultures where they are making an impact at the benefit of their employees, not at the cost of their employees. Why do you think there is so much resistance to leadership empathy in the, at the sea level? Uh, I think there's the misconception that empathy is weak. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's a, considered a feminine skill and in a male-dominated environment, I think they don't want to be per perceived as weak. That's a, and that's a real, that, that, that comes back to what I call the myth of rationality. <laughs> the, the idea, the idea that what 
I mean, this goes back 4,000 years uh, to the Greek philosophers who felt that what separated humans from other species of animals was our ability to reason and rationality. In fact, that's what Aristotle said and, and Plato too. But the truth of the matter is we're 98% emotional and only 2% rational. Yeah. And empathy, this is my definition of empathy. See what your take is. My definition of empathy is the ability to read, assimilate, interpret, and reflect back the emotional experience of another person. I like that. And so if we're 98% emotional, it seems to me that we ought to be developing emotional competency. And the, there are three three types of emotional competencies, emotional self-awareness, emotional self-regulation, and empathy. And what I've learned is that when you learn empathy, you automatically develop emotional self-awareness and self-regulation. It just yeah, happens I also, automatically. I also, like, I feel with my sense of develop, uh, of my overly developed sense of empathy, is my ability to understand corporations and industries. Oh, yes at a rapid pace. Like I Almost, could walk yeah, into an industry, right. have no understanding of it. And within right. two weeks, people who had been in that industry for years would ask me thinking I was the expert. Right. And I don't think that's intelligence. I don't think that's quick learning. I think that's empathy that's right. and the ability to see that systems and organizations, they have right. their own sense, common sense to them. That's right. And You're it's that right. level of empathy that allows. So yes, it's good for people, which I think I would wish that would be the number one priority. Yeah. <laughs> but I also yeah. know I'm an idealist. So you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's an idea whose time is coming, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, got into, I got into it coming from a different angle because as a peacemaker, I learned that all conflict is emotional and almost all conflict is associated with lack of empathy. And if I can teach people em empathy skills through affect labeling, that fourth level of reflective listening, they stop fights and arguments in their lives forever mm -hmm. and live peaceful lives. And that's what that that's what motivated me. You sound like, uh, uh, would you classify yourself as a highly sensitive person, HSR? A or HSP, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, my wife is one too. Mm -hmm. uh, and she works with, she works with a, uh, empathic people a lot uh, the ones that especially are dysfunctional because they're so sensitive they can't discern whether it's their own emotions or somebody else's emotions yeah and for me I, that was me for a long time yeah. uh and uh very sensitive to the energy and environment right. uh, which can lead to decline in mental health for me so learning i think that the earlier you are that you learn about who you are and your own strengths and weaknesses. Right. And also knowing that, like to me, I believe all of our strengths are also our greatest weaknesses and vice versa, right. but just the different sides of the coin. Um, but how we can support ourselves um, is, is key, but yeah. not that I wish more leaders had that empathy problem like I do, but <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, my wife and I worked with a lot of people that have, that have high levels of empathy that are then they're pretty dysfunctional and unhappy people. So I think moderation in all respects. It's true. And yeah. I think it's my experience is that it's easier to teach people who don't have empathy. It's easier to teach them how to be, how do you have empathy than it is to take people who are highly sensitive and teach them how to discern, have discernment around the emotional energy that they're confronted with every day. 100%. I mean, I, I, do, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I've, I've, the co-founder of the Prison of Peace Project, and I've trained thousands of incarcerated people in maximum security prisons, both men and women, how to be peacemakers and mediators to stop prison violence. And the first skill we teach them is how to listen to and reflect emotions. Mm. And <laughs> with incredible success. <clears throat> so if I can teach a, <clears throat> a murderer to, to become a peacemaker, you know, imagine what I can do with a normal person. Oh, 100%, yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. All right. Well, I, uh, I got one more question for you. Okay. <clears throat> we're, all, we're about 25, 20, 25 minutes in. And this is the question. It, this is a, a really interesting question. You, you've actually been fairly self-revelatory, but, but if there, tell us one thing about yourself that if we didn't, that, that if we didn't ask you and you didn't reveal it, nobody would know about it. Hmm. That is a good question. 
like about my personality yeah. or about my interests? Well, uh, for example, um, you wouldn't know this about me, but I play jazz and blues violin. Mm -hmm. So something like that. Anything. I'm a big, see, I talk about so many of my interests. So your people might not know, but my people, I'm a big reader. I'm a big uh, runner. Um, I'm writing a book, which again, oh, I'm, I am, I have been sharing it. So uh, I'm not writing a, a nonfiction book, which most, every time I say I'm writing a book, they're like, so what is it about? What, what is it about on careers? Like it's a fiction. Uh, it is a, I'm a big reader of all things, uh, but one of a genre that started to inspire me to look at my career differently was chiclet or contemporary women's fiction huh. uh, because they present careers in a completely different light than what I was brought up with, with high school and university. And these are the types of positions that you could have. And that's all that really existed. Uh, and I remember reading a couple of books, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago that talked about having your own schedule and having that one-to-one -one impact and kind of entrepreneurial without it being like, I'm owning my own business. And it really started me thinking about that. I know I'm in a long rambly thing right now. I promise oh, no. I'm going to get back to my, no, <laughs> my no. point. So I knew, I know how much a fiction novel can inspire people to think about their careers differently, to, to think, you know what, I kind of do want to be happy at work. Or I kind of want to feel fulfilled and to have a purpose and not just be on this hamster wheel of life and tolerating this thing. Uh, so I'm writing a book that does that. Excellent. So, I mean, yeah. I, what we find is fiction unlocks the imagination and tells us what's possible. It does. Yeah. And there, so I'm excited. I'm on my second draft for that. Okay. So we'll see how that goes. Well, good luck um, with that. I've written four books myself, all nonfiction. So I know the process. All nonfiction yourself. Good. Yeah. Um, what, huh. What's your genre? Well, uh, my first book was a textbook called Peacemaking, Practicing at the Intersection of Law and mm -hmm. Human Conflict, trying to train train law students. I'm a, I'm a part-time law professor, trying to teach uh, law students that human conflict is a lot more than just the law. And my second book was called Sex, Politics, and Religion at the Office. It was way ahead of its time. How, yeah. to, how, how to use diversity as a, to a competitive advantage. But that was decades ahead of its time. And my third book was called Elusive Peace, How Modern Diplomatic Strategies Could Better Resolve World Conflict. And that was a critique of the international diplomatic community. I, I read uh, a book on uh, uh, Clinton's negotiations at Camp David with the Israelis and the Palestinians. And I read the book and the account, and he just made every rookie mistake in the world. Mm -hmm. And that got me interested in looking at other international mediations. And I couldn't understand why, you know, commercial mediators settle cases, settle disputes at about a 90% effective rate. International diplomats are lucky if they get 10% of their cases resolved. Wow. And the reason is because they're using 17th century technology to solve 21st century. Oh. That's what I concluded. <laughs> and then my last book uh, is called Deescalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. And that one that one turned out to be an Amazon bestseller. So that was a good one. That's I, amazing. I had nice royalty checks on that one. <laughs> yeah. And in that book, I, I literally teach you how to calm any angry person or child in less than 90 seconds using using the thing the reflective listing that we talked about before affect labeling in particular when you label somebody else's emotions in the way that i described uh the brain scanning studies show that the emotional centers of the brain are inhibited while at the same time the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex is activated so literally as we lend our prefrontal cortex to that angry person there they calm down in 90 mm -hmm. seconds then they can't help themselves. Yeah. It's 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 just how the brain's hardwired. And like I said, this is the core skill that we teach in the Prison of Peace Project um, that allows incarcerated people who have had very violent pasts to be powerful peacemakers and stop prison violence. Well, much 
Mine is much more frivolous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it may be frivolous, but it may not be. Imagine if it goes out and inspires young women. That's all I care about. Yeah, you just you're yeah. just inspiring people and reaching them at the level where they're at, and I think that's really admirable. Yeah, I know that's my purpose is to help inspire and guide people well, towards for happiness, and this is one of the ways that I feel is uh, going to help. Well, great, and thank you so much for the conversation. Oh, you're welcome, Doug. <laughs>